Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Before we get started, just a few things to remember. You are able to ask questions. Uh, please post them in the Q&A and chat section and we will monitor those and address them at the end. If you'd like to leave any questions or feedback for the Chamber in general, please send them to info at windsoressexchamber.org. For COVID updates and helpful resources, visit our website. We have a COVID tab. As well, you can follow us on social media. We update daily, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. As well, if you've missed any of our previous webinars, you can, uh, you can watch the recorded uh, versions on our YouTube channel, and those can also be found on our website. We will get started in just a moment. We'll let everybody settle in. Okay, I will hand it off now to our Windsor Essex Regional Chamber of Commerce President and CEO, Rakesh Naidu. Thanks, Marina, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome back to the uh, webinar series that the Chamber has been offering. Uh, we continue to uh, monitor the, the situation, and uh, as you know, there is a lot of changes that are happening. Uh, yesterday, there was a few more businesses that were allowed to open up. Um, as you know, that last or over the weekend there have been few businesses such as uh, golf courses marinas and private parks that were allowed to open and um, then on tuesday yesterday we had few more businesses uh, including construction uh, businesses uh, those that are into retail those are operating online but also those who have curbside pickup and delivery uh, and all retail stores that have uh, street entrance uh, they've been allowed to open up Weaker dealerships, retailers, you know, so the list goes on. So slowly the province is uh, opening up and I think they're taking the right decision in terms of uh, monitoring the situation, uh, seeing how the reopening is happening and then accordingly taking the decision to open up the next uh, uh, group of businesses. So as uh, we, we monitor that situation uh, along with the province, uh, we continue to provide the feedback uh, to the various levels of government in terms of what we're seeing here locally. Uh, so from the business community, uh, what we would really expect would be um, a real um, feedback or in terms of what is your experience, you know, either as uh, consumers <clears throat> or as um, business owners, if you can tell us what has been your experience of reopening, if you are one of the businesses that has reopened, uh, so please give us that because it's a very valuable information and input that you'll be providing so that we can take that in, and, you know, see what are the lessons learned from that, uh, see what needs to be done to further improve, uh, lessen the burden, lessen the pain of reopening and provide that as input to uh, both the federal and the provincial government. Uh, so if you have any input for us, any feedback for us on reopening, please send it uh, to us at info at uh, windsoressexchamber.org. Uh, uh, Marina will have that on the chat as well. So we are really looking forward to hearing back from you in terms of what has been your experience and any ideas, suggestions, inputs that you have, uh, please do forward that to us as well. And uh, you know, uh, the federal government uh, has uh, made a few more announcements in terms of uh, programs. Uh, for those of you who have applied for the Canada Summers Jobs Program, you know, when it was reopened again, uh, when fresh intake was allowed. Uh, know that uh, May 22nd, so just two days from now, is the deadline for uh, putting in your application. So if you are one of those that have been approached uh, to submit an application, you know, May 22nd is by when you need to have the application submitted. Um, then the government has also, um, well, the provincial government has made a decision, as you know, uh, in terms of keeping the schools closed for the remainder of the school year, um, which um, definitely is something which is, I think, a step in the right direction, but it has its implication and consequences on the business community, uh, especially, you know, when it comes to businesses that are run by women, uh, women entrepreneurs, and uh, also if there are uh, families with young children at home, you know, how do we... Uh, take care of children and uh, still go to work. And that's a question that is something that needs to be addressed. 
and many people have talked about this and have connected with us in terms of the challenges uh, of you know having the schools closed and yet you know the intention to reopen our economy uh, a huge number of workforce uh, you know is needing support uh, you know child care support uh, men women both uh, and i think we will need to do something you know to ensure that the workforce is available uh, to work as we reopen uh, the uh, the uh, border as you know it has been closed till uh, june 21st and again it has its implications uh, on the business community as well. Uh, then I would say that the new program that, uh, or the extension of, of the eligibility, uh, or the expansion of the eligibility of CBA uh, for business owners has been very welcome. Uh, the government announced that it is going to uh, open up uh, the program for owner-operated businesses, uh, which is good. So those businesses that have not had a payroll or whose payrolls have been less than 20,000, uh, these businesses would be able to apply, uh, provided they have filled in uh, their tax return for 2018 or 2019. Um, so there are certain eligibility criteria. Uh, you know, that information will be on the Chamber's website as well. So please take a look at it. But I think this is a really welcome uh, initiative by the government to open up SIBA to include more businesses, especially the young startup companies. Uh, that were earlier on excluded from um, the SIBA program. And then also we are talking of women and women entrepreneurs. Uh, the government also announced a new program, which is you know a $15 million uh, additional funding to support women entrepreneurs. And that's through the Women Entrepreneurship Strategy Program. Um, so that is, uh, again, a very welcome initiative. And there's a new program uh, which was announced to support large organizations uh, who have... Um, uh, you know, a revenue of more than $300 million. And if they need uh, a bridge loan in excess of $60 million. So that's a program that's been announced. And the last one is on the commercial rent relief, where there's been a lot of conversation about the challenges that this program is, uh, is having currently because of, uh, you know, uh, less number of people that have taken advantage of it. Only 10% of businesses have uh, applied for this. Uh, for reasons uh, that we know, which is, you know, one is the eligibility criteria in terms of drop of business volume, which is 70%, which is quite steep. And then also it requires the landlord to be, um, uh, to, to agree to uh, provide this assistance. And in some cases, both or one of them uh, doesn't uh, happen or doesn't work out. So that has created some issues uh, with uh, organizations it, it being able to tap this program. Uh, anyway, we continue to work with uh, the various levels of government and our partners in the, the Chamber Network uh, to see what can be done to, you know, to make this more accessible uh, and open for businesses. So uh, that's a snapshot of where we are today. You know, things continue to change, as you know. Uh, but the good thing is that the businesses are coming back online slowly uh, but surely. Uh, but at this time, you know, we need to be very, very, you know, careful and diligent about uh, maintaining social distancing, main, you know, ensuring that we are uh, using PPEs, uh, keeping our uh, ourselves, our uh, employees, our workplace safe, um, because this is important for reopening. If we slip on this, uh, God forbid, you know, if we have a second wave, it'll be very painful and it will undo all the good work that's been done in the last uh, few months. So each one of us uh, has to own up the responsibility of ensuring a workplace that is safe and compliant to the guidelines provided by the health officials. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Keith Chinri, who is the Director of Membership Services, and he will lead us uh, to uh, the next part of the session. What do you, Keith? Great. Thank you very much, Rakesh. Uh, I appreciate that. And thank you uh, for the invitation to participate today. I understand this is the uh, 16th webinar that the Chamber of Commerce has presented since we went into COVID lockdown. And I congratulate you on the uh, number, the frequency that you've hosted uh, for our members and future members uh, to this point. And I know that we have some additional webinars scheduled that we will uh, talk about as well. And, you know, we should also mention uh, the involvement of Marina Poljak, 
who is the events coordinator at the Chamber of Commerce. He really is the one that puts all these together and uh, does all sorts of coordination behind the scenes to make it happen. So thanks to uh, both Marina and Rakesh for the opportunity to be involved today. Uh, it was nice to see uh, Rakesh with uh, uh, casual clothes on today. He's uh, one of the snappiest dressers in the area. Today he's got his Wind City uh, sweatshirt on, which is great to see. I uh, noticed that earlier today, the uh, city uh, and tourism Windsor Essex announced a new campaign. They're selling YQG Strong t-shirts. That's a uh, hashtag and a campaign that's been out uh, last several weeks. And, and in conjunction with BB Branded, they have the YQG Strong uh, t-shirts available uh, for sale. So you can find out some more information on that. In addition to the uh, recent openings this week that Rakesh mentioned, uh, the city has also just announced that off-leash dog parks basketball courts, uh, skateboard parks, picnic areas, benches, and uh, some non-permit sports fields are now open to the public. So as the weather uh, gets nicer, and uh, these are all good things that are happening. So we all need to be safe and, and uh, um, uh, follow along proper guidelines, but those are all good signs uh, of things uh, that are happening in our area. The city has also announced a, uh, today a small business action plan uh, that involves the waiving of some uh, permit fees, particularly for outdoor patios. And uh, I think there are many of us that are anxious to get out to those outdoor patios. Uh, they've also uh, waived the rental fees at Lansbury Park and are uh, providing some support for uh, BIAs uh, in the area as well. And I think you'll find more and more events being announced uh, as a result of those uh, changes uh, today. So uh, those are all good things for our region here in uh, Windsor-Essex. Our uh, webinar today is, uh, the title is Finding Your Brand's Voice During Uncertain Times. And just before we get into introducing our guest speaker, I'll just remind everybody again that we have a series of business briefs interactive webinars scheduled. Uh, that includes tomorrow's topic, which is on the art of networking. Uh, it starts at 2.30. It's also free registration. And this will be uh, a panel uh, series that we have featuring Elizabeth Elias Hernandez from Parker DKI, Mike Clark from the Windsor Essex Children's Aid Society, Brian Yeomans representing the DWBIA and FHC Hotels and Resorts, and our other panelist is Candace Dennis of Blackburn Radio and uh, also representing the Tecumseh BIA. Uh, as you know, those are all people that do an awful lot of networking in our area when we're allowed to be together. And I think they'll have some great insight tomorrow on, uh, on the art of networking. So that's tomorrow at 2.30. We also have a webinar uh, coming up with the Windsor Essex Health Unit scheduled for uh, May 28th on health and safety. More details to come on that. And our rescheduled date with Barter Pay, a new partnership that the Chamber has formed with this national program that allows you to uh, conduct business through Barter without using cash. That date has been rescheduled to uh, June 9th, also at 2.30. And again, you can uh, register for free on these, uh, for these webinars on our website, windsoressexchamber.com, or .org, sorry, .org. And uh, again, those are free uh, for members and also for future members of uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Okay, so on to uh, today's uh, webinar, Finding Your Brand's Voice During Uncertain Times. Um, Batman has Robin and SCO has research. And today we have Rebecca Stasco, the principal and lead strategist at SCO Communications here in Windsor Essex as our guest speaker. Rebecca has provided over 20 years of communications and marketing solutions for a variety of businesses in both Canada and also in Europe. She has a master's degree in strategic communications and has significantly improved the bottom line for her clients by helping to ensure the clarity in everything that they do and everything that they say. That's a bit of background uh, for, on Rebecca, on SCO Communications themselves. They specialize in building remarkable brands by uniting the fabric of a management consultancy with the creativity of a design agency. Their big dig always begins with research, from competitive analysis to consumer relevancy. SCO Communications develops marketing strategies that help position you as a leader. And as they say, successful brands don't follow, they lead. We're going to hear all about that today, about finding your brand's voice during uncertain times from SCO Communications and from Rebecca Stasco. And at this time, I will turn it over to Rebecca to begin her presentation. Hi, thank you, uh, Keith and Rakesh, and to all the chamber. Um, I just want you to know that today's aim 
of this presentation is to really give you strong take it, takeaways, which you can discuss and start to action back at your office. But please note many of the concepts discussed simply skim the surface of what's involved in repositioning and rethinking your brand voice during a recession. So do feel free to reach out following the presentation if you require further clarification or information and where applicable our sources are listed at the end of this presentation. So thank you. So um, next slide, please. The agenda for today is uh, a little ambitious, but I'm sure we can accomplish. Uh, we're gonna look at your brand goals, talk about research, consumer behavior, auditing your brand, brand personality, messaging, and in closing, promotion and placement. So first, brand goals. As much as the environment seems to be negative, it is important to know what you have control over. Next slide, please. This comes back to, the, to your brand goals, knowing what works and what you can take advantage of. We have taken the liberty of writing down a few goals for you. I think we can all agree that remaining viable as a brand during this time is probably at the top of most of our lists. Remaining, uh, being authentic to yourself, your employees, your community, being relevant and memorable. If you feel your brand may not be set to achieve the above during times of extreme change, we urge you to look at what you can and should control during times of uncertainty. We'll look at ways to modify and repeat what works and adjust what doesn't. You'll notice we've highlighted three words above, authentic, relevant, and memorable. Next slide. Borrowed from our strategy partners at Giro Creative in Detroit, these three words are the guiding principles to a solid brand. When working with clients such as Magna International or even rebranding the district of Detroit, Giro always begins by ensuring that a brand is set to be authentic, relevant, and memorable. But how do we get there? How do we get you there? To ensure that you're truly authentic, relevant and remarkable in everything you do and say. So let's take a look at each guiding principle a little closer. Authenticity. To ensure this, SCO dives deep to understand your company 360 degrees, and we urge you always to do the same. The goal here is to be a genuine reflection of your brand's history, culture, and value system. However, I'd like to share an important point and caveat about authenticity. Although you shouldn't compromise your authenticity at any time, the public will remember if you are only being opportunistic during challenging and high profile times. So ask yourself, especially now, is being social res socially responsible part of who we really are as a brand? Next, let's look at relevant. How do we ensure relevancy? You need to understand your consumers, current and potential. And we say current and potential because they will change and they're changing as we, as we speak. And you need to understand industry trends, right? This allows you to ensure you are speaking with an appropriate voice and you represent what consumers seek or expect from your industry. And this can also change during times of recession. And finally, how do we ensure a brand is memorable? We need to understand the category that you're operating in and all the competitors that are also operating in your space. Because the goal here is that, is that stakeholders, anyone from a consumer to your neighboring business, they should be able to discern your brand from direct and local competitors. So you may think you know your competitors, but we urge you, to look left and right even more during times of change to see what your competitors are doing. Next slide. A 2008 stat from a McKenzie research group uh, really, really is scary. Only 23% of execs learn about competitors' new products early enough to respond before they hit the market. You or they may have pivoted their business, your competitors, I mean. They may have changed their product offering, service models, and hence now you're solving a whole new problem 
for a whole new group of people. Next. So we also urge you to ensure your brand is memorable by asking yourself the following questions. What do your competitors look like now? How are they speaking? Who are they speaking to? And how do you stack up and compare? Once you can ensure, assure you are being authentic, relevant, and memorable, these principles should permeate your actions, your messaging, and design, setting you up for greater success. Next. Yet, as the famous philosopher and essayist George Santayana so rightly puts, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Anyone who knows our team at SCO also knows how important research is to our process. Yet COVID-19 and our current economic situation leaves us with very little to go on when drawing on best practices. We can and should, to a certain degree, look back at past recessions, right? Well, looking at 2008, we can learn from the differences of what happened as well. As 2008 was an economically caused recession, next, this one has a medically, this, this recession right now is a medically induced recession. And the, and the cause, therefore, is very different. Everyone is living, behaving, and sharing in uncertainties that affects all of our purchase decisions. Living in isolation, dealing with mental health issues, sharing more or even oversharing as we see online, the list goes on. Next. This recession is about consumer confidence. Even those who are okay financially are still affected psychologically and it affects our purchase decision from tangibles to experiences. Buying toilet paper, to a master class on how to improve your tennis game. Many will also look as far back to 1918 for parallels, but this can really only provide insights from a medical standpoint. So where does this leave us? Next. Well, let's start with what we or you should know, your customers, and then we'll dive into some research and consumer behavior change psychology specific to recessions. Okay, now I want to introduce you to Jan. Next. Jan is aged 45 to 54 and represents an avatar we created for a client who runs a chain of retail stores. She's married with one child, puts work and family before herself. She's career-minded, recently promoted so financially comfortable as well, strives for, for, for perfection in everything she does and likes her appearance to reflect that. She definitely supports the shop movement, local, mo local movement, shops online, but prefers face-to-face -face interaction. Where does she get her information? Social, primarily, and prefers LinkedIn, blogs, and podcasts. Jan might be the perfect fictitious representation for your primary or secondary target, depending on what you're selling. Either way, you need to know certain things about whoever your target is. Next. So this is Jan now just after the Victoria Day weekend. She's looking a little different, a little tired. She's got coffee in her hand. How things have changed for her during such uncertain times. How does she react to uncertainty? The image on the left actually gives you a glimpse of what this mom is now, that's now working from home, is dealing with during this pandemic. Trouble staying focused on work, meeting child's emotional needs, well working, no concrete start or end time. It's quite a few listed here. Where she used to have a clear division between work and home, and plenty of time to listen to podcasts during her commute and checking her LinkedIn on her lunch break religiously, everything has now changed. From where she goes to information, to how she spends her downtime, to what her priorities are when it comes to purchase decisions. If she were your consumer, 
and she loved reading blogs. Now she's certainly reading less blogs as her home and work life has been altered. Instead, she now checks the news constantly, looking for apps to keep her kid occupied and educated and prioritizes the family supply of essentials over and beyond anything else. Knowing where your consumer is, do, is during more stable times is as important as ensuring you understand their behavior when a recession hits. This is crucial in planning and strategizing your next move. Next. In fact, Jan and her new behavior will likely fall into one of the four groups clearly summarized by a Harvard Business Review research paper. First up is slam on the brake segment. As the title infers, the segment feels most vulnerable and hardest hit financially, reducing all types of spending by eliminating, postponing, decreasing, or substituting purchases. This group not only includes lower income consumers, but will include anxious high in higher income consumers as well, particularly if health or income circumstances change for the worse. Next is the pained but patient segment, who tend to be resilient and optimistic about the long term, but less, less confident about the prospects for recovery in the near term or their ability to maintain their standard of living. Like the slam on the brakes consumers, they economize in all areas, though less aggressively. They constitute the largest segment and include the great majority of households unaffected, so that's key, unaffected by unemployment. But as news gets worse, pain but patient consumers increasingly migrate into the slam on the brakes segment. Next up is the comfortably well off. This segment feels secure about their ability to ride out current and future bumps in the economy. They consume at near pre-recession levels, though now they tend to be a little more selective about their purchases. The segment consists primarily of people in the top 5% income bracket. It also includes those who are less wealthy but feel confident about the stability of their finances. And the final group is the Live for Today segment, which carries on as usual and for the most part remains unconcerned about savings. The consumers in this group respond to the recession mainly by extending their timeline for making major purchases. Typically, urban and younger, they are more likely to rent than own, and they spend on experiences rather than stuff, unless it's electronics. They're unlikely to change their consumption behavior unless they become unemployed. So where does my, my service fall? Next, you must also consider your specific product or service as well. Are you considered essential now or will you be post COVID? Is your service expendable during a recession or do we fall somewhere in between and therefore considered a treat or postponable? Let's take a look at the different categories. Essentials are defined as something necessary for survival or perceived as central to well being, where postponables needed or desired items whose purchase can be reasonably put off. Expendables perceived as unnecessary or unjustifiable. And finally, there's the treats. Indulgences whose immediate purchase is considered justifiable. Customers will react differently depending how they view your brand offering during normal times, let alone during recession. So take time to figure out where you fall. And everything from where to focus your marketing efforts to how you should engage your ideal customer der derives from you understanding the above. So next we'll look at tailoring your tactics. Take a look at your product and consumers in your consumers and you'll help you product in how they prioritize consumption. They'll base their behavior on this during an economic downturn. And in turn, this is how you should, you should affect your marketing tactics. 
So our first example takes the slam on the brake segment. If you can see by the left-hand column, the product, if you're offering an essential product, which again, to remind you, is, a ne is necessary for survival or perceived as being central to well-being, this segment will react and prioritize the purchase. So they'll always seek out uh, this particular product, though they may look for lower costs or brand substitutes. So if you're offering an essential product to the slam on the brake segment, a marketing tactic to consider would be to emphasize price point, okay? That wallet friendly pricing. However, if again, you're dealing with the slam on the brake segment, but you, your product and service is deemed postponable, something that's needed or desired, but the purchase can be reasonably put off, the consumer reaction would be to delay these purchases, okay? So a marketing tactic that you may wanna consider would be to offer layaway plans or promote exceptional deals to promote purchasing now, okay? Let's take a look at one more example. Our second example uses the comfortably well-off segment. Again, if you're offering an essential where it's deemed necessary for survival, this segment will continue to buy favorite brands at pre-recession levels. So they're less price sensitive. So what should your marketing tactic do? Okay, think about continuing awareness advertising because again, they're not price sensitive. Okay, now if, you're, if your product or service is deemed postponable, comfortably well off, will seek better quality for the price, and might negotiate harder at the point of sale. So your marketing tactic, a marketing tactic you may wanna consider would be to promote savings from buying now. Advise customers they're missing out by postponing. Next, but how do I get started on all this, you might say? Or how do I know what to change? At SCO, we almost always stand, start with a brand audit, regardless of the client's ask. We do this to take note of where a brand has been, where they are presently, prior to propelling them forward in a given direction. And if you, are, if you attempt to embark on this internally, uh, the time is definitely now. So here's where we would actually advise you to start. First, you wanna look at all of your external and internal messaging. Next. And, it, and try to locate any discrepancies. You're gonna review your current materials, looking to ensure that they are relevant and, and all of your placements are relevant. Should they be expanded or increased or reconsidered altogether? And remember, we are not just speaking of advertisements here, but anywhere your messaging may be. This can include training manuals to service scripts. With each piece of collateral, so I'm talking pamphlets, okay, even, or, or it could be your, a web page, you want to ask yourself, it is, a, is it on brand? Does it reflect your latest changes to your offering, your brand voice, your personality? Stakeholder interviews with employees, staff, management, even customers can help you further identify any gaps in understanding and can help you further revise or clarify messaging. The latter can be done, by the way, at any time, yet once you know what you have and what you wish to say, the timing of the interviews will make more sense and obviously will hold greater value. We like to stress that interviews should not be done one, one at a time one at a time, or sorry, it shouldn't be a one, a one time task. This should be planned and repeated as an ongoing marketing maneuver. Interviews can be planned to take place even after a campaign that consists simply of two adverts in order to get feedback and tweak things accordingly as things change. Okay, next. Oh, one more, sorry. One more. Oh, no, this is perfect. Oh, back. Oh, 
<laughs> okay. Um, mind the gap. Something we like to say a lot around here. So a key goal of any brand audit is to identify and fix messaging and visuals that may represent that disconnect between one piece of a brand's experience and another. So note that messaging includes both the content and tone, where visuals would be the look and feel of all creatives and even an atmosphere. And by that, I mean the atmosphere that a consumer enters when looking to purchase, right? Maybe your storefront um, or just the atmosphere that you're giving off on an online store. At SCO, we equate any discrepancies or gaps to commercials interrupting a good movie. We all know what that feels like. So the end goal of your brand audit is to achieve a cohesive look and feel as well as pointed key messaging. So again, mind the gap. So next, let's move on to your brand's personality. Marketers actually use something called brand archetypes. I don't know if you've heard of them or not, um, not a big deal. They're essentially personalities that help create a deep connection to a given market, target market, sorry. They also provide a focus, focused voice, which should be recognizable by your, your consumers and your competitors, and hopefully will resonate with all of them. Archetypes also provide a framework for your staff when producing any new messaging and materials. At SCO, we dive deep and we'll look, at, look to see what archetypes or personalities are being used quite readily in certain categories and what companies are excelling and using their chosen brand personality. So next we're gonna look at two advertisements in the financial industry. Two banks, two very different personalities they offer pretty much the exact same services. And you can see that the one on the left is using a personality that, which we call the jester. Um, they use humor, right, to make you smile with lighthearted fun. Essentially, they're say cheese. It really should be a picture of someone, but it's a picture of your check as we go to you know, deposit online these days. Where the ad on the right Again, they probably offer the same service. They've chosen the every man or every woman route. Um, and that archetype uses, uses um, a strategy to appeal to everyone. So they remove all the pretentiousness of, of anything they could put into an ad. Again, even their tagline. Finally, a bank that's more about people than money. You can imagine how different the experiences would be dealing with one bank over the other just by their ad, or hopefully and there's not a disconnect, right? So you can see that choosing the ideal archetype for your business is essential. But the question that we ask today is, should a brand change the way they speak during a recession? Should we change our creative style or voice when many people are struggling? So although the decision is quite personal, you may see brands playing up certain aspects of their identity during such times. So let's explore two further archetypes to get a better idea of what I mean. There's a couple, there's a couple things, there's a couple things I'd like to see. I needed you in the dead of night. Wake of the day, first broken light. I'd follow you. I never realized how much I need. Comfort. What we deliver by delivering. So FedEx is a brand that can play up the hero personality very easily, specifically in this COVID induced recession where their deliveries help us all to survive and rise, rise to our current challenges. The hero makes the world better by being the best. A hero brand isn't concerned with nurturing you. They're interested in challenging you. If you want to rise to the occasion, you're going to need a hero's help. So next we'll look at one more. All you have to do is to look at a newborn child and watch their eyes move around. We want to see 
to explore. We, as human beings, we need that. I wasn't one of those absolute naturals, but since childhood, I'd seen pictures of the great explorers, and I felt that, you know, I'd like to plant the flag. The three of us, we were very fiery people. The bug was on our back to perform. We really had, with the backpacks, what we needed to survive. There's a little bit of danger uh, in the unknown, but human beings, I find, are just not apt to back away from something that is a challenge. It took eight days altogether. Yeah, we barely made it, but we did make it. We were pushing the limits pretty close. Feelings are not something that we have recorders for. People will always have a desire to explore what they haven't seen, whether it's above us on the surface or down in the depths of the ocean. Okay, so obviously North Face, it works. Um, this is a classic Explorer brand. Freedom is really all the Explorer cares about. Where other brands might help you to build a home, Explorer brands want to get you outside. And it might be the proverbial outside um, in some cases. With this in mind, it makes sense that many outdoor brands are naturally, natural fits uh, to the Explorer archetype. During this recession, we're already seeing many brands adapt their brand voice using more explore language. As they help the consumer escape through access to experiences or simply enabling them to continue to grow personally. But what are the ideal personalities during a recession? And should we just change our creative style or voice to match the times? What about those who use humor in their brand voice? Could a gesture type of personality offend when many are struggling? They're really good questions. And we've already been asked this by quite a few clients. Um, and, and it is very, very personal. And we'll touch on this um, um, as we go forward. Next, let's look at a local company, um, Festival Tent. And they've been around for over 35 years. And they're a pretty classic hero brand with a little bit of jester undertone. And they've actually changed their offering um, to position, you know, in these, during these uncertain times, right? They're positioning what they offer as more essential. However, they still use some humor in an understated way. So you can see on the left, we've got inspiration can happen everywhere, anywhere. Um, Portage on on top of a mountain, which is funny in itself. And you know, the play on inspiration can even happen in a Portage on. Um, and then now their current ads, um, again, still with a humor undertone, visit grandma without visiting John, but still they're trying to sell what they have, but they're trying to solve a problem for the current times and their consumer uh, point, pain point. Okay, renting that personal use portable toilet so you don't have to enter grandma's house. Next, we have First Stop Services, a local shredding and document storage company. Again, primarily a hero brand and jester undertones again. Uh, they too have pivoted their offering to reflect the current social distancing restrictions. So you can, they haven't changed too much that you don't, they're unrecognizable, right? The guy in the tie buried in paper doesn't work as well anymore. People aren't wearing ties as much. Look at Rakesh, he was in a, in a sweatshirt um, during the intro. Um, so 
so again, they've, they needed to change some adverts up both because they're offering change, but because they deemed this not as appropriate during this time and maybe wouldn't resonate as much because people aren't in their offices and their ties and, and whatnot. Um, so again, 0% contact, 100% shred, still funny and light, um, lighthearted in its delivery. Okay. Um, now let's turn to messaging. In marketing, the term messaging refers to how an organization talks about itself and the value it provides. Related to positioning, messaging is an approved, and I'll repeat, an approved set of key points or messages an organization uses to communicate about something with a target audience. So if it's approved, someone should have audited it. We should it should have been looked at, right? Okay, so next, I wanna give you some considerations when looking at your messaging, okay? So first is content versus tone. So if content refers to the guts of the message, the subject matter, which is what we are actually saying, okay, versus the tone, which refers to how we are saying it, you need to understand that both will need your attention separately and together, okay? Second, the big question of toning things up or toning down, right? Can we use humor or can we be upbeat in our delivery even though it's times are, are, are bad, right? There's struggle out there. This decision is quite personal and depends on three things really. Your consumer, the product and service you are selling, and your team's comfort level in towing the brand line in this way. There's nothing wrong in making people chuckle as long as it's not at the expense of others. And you want to ensure your team's all on the same page because you don't want to have that gap, right, between one part of your brand experience or story and another. And thirdly, and one that's come up quite often, and I think a lot of people are thinking, and because we're even sick of seeing it on different adverts, everything starting with uh, due to COVID, you know, that precursor to most of our messaging right now. Do we still need to use it? Do we always need to use it? When can we stop? Um, so we don't feel personally at SCO that you necessarily need to use it all the time, unless you um, are taking away or reducing access to, a, to your product or service, then your audience does not need to be constantly reminded that you are offering widget X uh, via a different delivery, delivery method due to COVID. If they can still have access to it, you're, you're now offering it via a different delivery method, well then that is the new norm. That's, that's just what's happening now, okay? Um, you give your consumers some type of credit in knowing that they realize things have changed right now due to COVID. Okay. There are 37 ways to say, do you want to come over for dinner? This is proof that archetypes and brand personality selection affects everything, including copywriting. So I use this a lot with my clients. In fact, there's more than 37 ways to say, do you want to come over for dinner? But the following that I'm going to show you is a simple example of how language influences the feeling the consumer would get by simply using different personality or voice in your writing. So if you look at the top left, Will you come over for dinner? Join for dinner? Hungry? Guess who's cooking? We really are going from a more formal way of speaking to informal. Okay, again, the, you can imagine all the ways in between and on either side that we could ask someone to come over for a meal. Okay, but if someone asks you, will you come over for dinner versus hungry, guess who's cooking? You can already imagine, and so would your brand, your consumer, imagine what type of experience you're actually offering up, OK? 
okay? So again, the second example um, is, is, shows the importance and difference of even naming fields on a job board website. So obviously skills and experience is much more, gives off a much more formal vibe versus asking you to list your past gigs, right? So some food for thought. Next, we look at promotion and placement. Times have changed and therefore, show, so should where you, show, uh, excuse me, so should um, where you consider putting your messaging. We know one thing for sure. People are online more than ever. So your social media right now is doing most of the heavy lifting. On the next slide, you will see that that we are sharing this not so secret formula as a reminder that best practices still stand. 80-20. You can Google this. It comes up time and time again, but it does still stand. Uh, when you're planning out uh, social messaging, 80% should be valuable content, content. And if you want to split that down a little bit more, 60% would be helpful or useful info for your consumer, and 20% of that 80 would be support followers and friends, okay? And then you get your 20% of promotion. So if you imagine 10 posts in a week, two are sell, 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 and eight is anything but sell, but it should add value to the lives of your followers, okay? So let's look at this a little bit more um, in use. Just by looking at Festival Tent, here we are again, by looking at their Facebook page, we were able to determine what their social conversation map would look like. And by the way, conversation maps are a great way to engage your team in planning out what you should be speaking about online. So starting at the left bottom, an example of value, valuable content in the yellow, how to celebrate, celebrate differently. Obviously, people are not having big events right now. So Festival Tent is not telling you to rent a tent and gather in your backyard. No, they're actually, this post would be all about how to just celebrate differently at home, right? It might be throwing up a sheet and making a, sh uh, a fort in your house for your kids to have cupcakes under. You know, therefore, adhere to social distancing, but we still want you to celebrate everything right? It's helpful. It's a great idea. It's valuable content. And it still falls within what they should care about, which is celebrations. Just above that, we have a good example of a promotional post. Share photos showing how you are helping the community. So a lot of people get confused and they would think this is valuable content and they're not selling. They're just saying, hey, look at this. We gave this tent away for free. But Let's be clear about something. This is clear self-promotion, whether you include a call to action to urge and push or push for purchase or not, okay? Other things that you might wanna include on your conversation map, and you can see our little Pac-Man ghost in the corner, um, would be to, to list things that you should not be speaking of or you don't want your staff or team member to speak about. Um, proper sanitation is one that would be on festivals, uh, festival tents conversation map because they do speak about proper sanitation when it comes to their, their portable toilets, for example. That being said, they have to be extremely careful that they're not talking generally about proper sanitation right now during COVID times, okay? Okay, so what are we doing now? When we think where we should consider placing our messaging or adverts, we need to think about what our consumers are doing differently now because you can be certain their daily routine has shifted or changed. Many of our new habits may very well become our new normal. Yes, the pandemic is forcing us to expand our tastes, adapt and try new things, but we urge you, do not look at this as an interim marketing exercise or plan. Many of us will never feel the need to enter the LCBO, that's me personally, or Zares again, 
as you know what curbside pickup is way too convenient i have more time for everything else okay so here's some food for thought just to give you some ideas as we're on we're all online more searching for the latest news media outlets like windsor right have seen a surge in readership in fact they enjoyed over 500,000 engagements within the first week of the COVID outbreak in March, as people were scouring the internet for the latest news and their following continues to increase. Radio, I mean, we have the AM 800 logo up there. Obviously we have lots of radio stations around, but um, radio, again, something to reconsider if it's not part of your, your placement mix. I wanna get out of my house every day, even if I'm not going into the office. So what do I do? I go out for drives and the radio comes on and I want the latest news. The radio is the perfect place to go for that. Okay. Uh, we transfer for those of us that are working from home and we need a giant file sent to us and email won't cut it. We transfer and the use of such services has gone up, gone up and there's opportunity for ad placements on such service pages. Okay. And what about people that are looking to keep busy in isolation or just escape the everyday? The, you know, although many physical locations may be closed to the public, when I'm talking about the art gallery, for example, or the Windsor Symphony, these recreation sites um, are actually offering a lot of online es escapism through cultural experiences. So do not discount such businesses to, um, to provide rich opportunity for sponsor sponsorships and a way for you to get your brand messaging out there in front of your consumer. Okay. So finally, so although I can't speak for everyone here today, I can say with confidence that I feel like I need to escape more and get out for more walks. In fact, I think we can all say that in most neighborhoods, walking both for leisure and exercise is up. So depending on your product or service, do consider out of home advertising as an option. And for those of you not familiar with out of home advertising as a term, this includes everything from park benches, park benches to bus shelters. And remember more often people are walking in their own neighborhoods. So where before I might get in my car in Riverside, and drive downtown to work and really ignore my surroundings. It was just quick escape. Now I'm actually walking the same streets going around and around with my kids or alone and probably paying a little bit more attention to what's around me, including those park benches that offer advertising placement opportunities. Okay, so let's fast forward a few months. Our primary consumer, Jan. She's back at work in her office. She's meeting with clients in, per in person. She looks so happy to be away from her family. Um, I'll just put it out there. Um, like us though today, Jan will hopefully realize how integral understanding consumers, their behavior, and our brand's capacity to adapt. This will continually prove useful in strategizing your brand for success. So with that, I'll leave you. Um, I hope that you'll have a few takeaways um, from today's webinar that you can take back to the office, discuss with your team or take back home to your home office, discuss with your team. And please do feel free to, to reach out to SCO if you need any clarification or added information. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, extremely, extremely timely. So thank you very much to you and the team at SCO Communications for putting that together. Um, we will uh, open things up for questions for Rebecca. If you have anything, please use the uh, chat feature and uh, we can uh, read your question from there. Uh, I've also posted uh, in the chat feature right now a link to a survey that the Chamber of Commerce has partnered on with the Odette School of Business on organizational resilience and employee engagement. That survey just went out in the community yesterday and the link is there if you want to connect with that survey. It'll take you about 15 or 20 minutes to go through it. 
but I think you'll find it a valuable exercise as well. So again, if you have any uh, questions for Rebecca on any of the content that was presented here this afternoon, or just any questions in general, anything that doesn't involve algebra, I think she has a, a cutoff point there, but if it had anything to do with marketing or finding your brand's voice in these uncertain times, please use the, uh, the chat feature and we'll present those uh, questions uh, to her. Uh, I really enjoyed the uh, conversation map that you presented, not just the uh, Pac-Man characters that I think that we can all relate to, but there are certain things that we don't want to talk about, and we need to have those discussions internally to make sure those questions don't get, or those uh, subjects don't get out there and uh, become uncomfortable for all of us to have to address. I also like uh, how you use the uh, references of content versus tone because definitely uh, the messaging can come down to uh, the tone, the approach, the speed of the message, uh, the background, the music, any of that kind of thing. Uh, so content and, uh, and tone I thought was, uh, was a very important part of uh, what you presented. I also personally uh, saw myself in many of those consumer segments that you talked about, uh, both pre-COVID and, and during COVID. And I think uh, during COVID, we're looking for some of those instant gratification purchases just to try to make ourselves feel good. And uh, some of those purchases may even be uh, at the refrigerator a little bit more often or when we're doing our click and collect from the grocery store, buying some of those uh, foods that, you know, we avoided pre-COVID, but now are kind of those comfort foods and, and make us... Uh, feel good and, and try to cope with uh, with the pandemic. So uh, I have a question here for you, Rebecca. You talked about the uh, brand audit process. Um, and obviously that's not something that's gonna happen overnight, but can you give us a sense of how long it would take for a company or an organization to go through that type of brand audit that you talked about? What, what would the length of time be for that type of uh, process? Yeah, it really depends on the size of the organization and obviously how open the, the business owners are to, to sharing their information um, with whether it's in a different internal teams um, or external consultants, um, because at certain times um, interviews with with staff are not included in the process or, or different stakeholders or they'll, they will ask um, us or um, do not want to put their two cents in as far as how, how the management necessarily feels about um, you know, the, the current marketing materials, for example. Um, so it, it is really dependent on, on size. I mean, you're looking at a minimum, even for a smaller organization of, of you know, two to three weeks uh, to really go through something um, with a fine uh, hair tooth comb. And I think some businesses have had a chance to do that while they're, they were closed uh, because they weren't considered essential. It really gave a lot of business owners and, and uh, companies a chance to reflect and regroup. I mean, you know, it, uh, we realized that COVID was coming and it would eventually hit Windsor-Essex, but there wasn't a large amount of time to gear up for this, to change our branding. So some people had to do that very quickly. And again, when your business was closed, it kind of gave people an opportunity to do that and then bring out their messaging or change their offerings, whether, whether it's through curbside or enhanced uh, e-commerce or, or that type of thing. So and that's an important uh, part of this process as well. Yeah, um, I'd like you talk to... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, just to add to that, you know, and there's nothing wrong with getting something out the door quickly and then tweaking after the fact. And again, I mentioned a few times during this presentation that this should not be looked at as a, you know, an interim marketing plan that you're developing. Um, much of what we're seeing now will change consumer behavior for the long term. Um, so do invest to some extent on improving your messaging or your materials, um, even if you you know rushed out the door to to get whether it be a you know signage up or some some something on your website. Relook at that if you have time. Engage a staff member that you're having trouble even keeping busy to you know to do everything from print absolutely everything out maybe that you that you currently have out there or you know screenshots of all of your digital and really take a look at where everything needs to be changed. Even that will make a massive difference in ensuring that you um, are minimizing any gaps, right, in brand experience. 
Absolutely. We have a request in the uh, chat to uh, post the last slide again with the resources uh, because they wanted to have another look at that. I'm not sure if that's possible uh, right now. I will say, though, that all of our, uh, the Chamber's webinars are posted on our YouTube channel, or you can find it uh, on our website as well uh, in the event section or in our COVID section. You can go back and uh, watch today's webinar again, and you'll be able to get that last slide uh, information as well. Or Rebecca's uh, email address is posted in the chat. If you'd like to contact her directly, I'm sure she'd be happy to share the information from that last uh, slide uh, with you uh, on an indi individual basis uh, as well. So just, uh, you know, maybe as we uh, start to wrap things up here, because we've, we've gone just past uh, the 60 minute mark. And again, if you uh, want to uh, get in touch with Rebecca, her uh, email address is there. And uh, would you, uh, can you share your uh, website address with us as well, please? Yep, it's scoclarity.com, S-K-O-C-L-A-R-I-T-Y.com. Okay, fantastic. And that's uh, in the chat there as well. And this, uh, I guess, maybe one uh, question to wrap up, and you kind of touched on this, is not everyone's marketing or advertising uh, is dealing with COVID. Perhaps their product isn't, uh, you know, uh, relevant uh, to COVID or situations. But when is the time when companies can start to move on, I guess, uh, from some of that messaging, because what I'm finding when I'm watching television or listening to the radio, uh, that you know, 90% or more of the commercials are making reference to COVID. We're going through uncertain times. It's uh, unsettling times. Whatever the the phrase is that you know that company has come up with, and quite frankly, it can be a bit of overload. Sometimes when I'm listening to the radio, I want to escape the fact that there's a pandemic going on. But every time there's a commercial break, you get reminded from that message. Messaging. So at what point, not so much a date in the calendar, but at what point can a company move on in their advertising uh, and not be referencing COVID, being sympathetic, obviously, to what everybody's going through, but having the messaging of, you know, we're kind of coming out the other side. When do you see that happening? Yeah, it's, there's no clear answer. And it's interesting, if you really look at who's using that that COVID intro to, to some of their messaging. It can also be because it's a, a lazy way of showing how they're solving a problem and change your life for the better. Um, and then others are using that, you know, precursor COVID intro um, because they want to know, want people to know, oh, I'm open for business or we're only open for curbside pickup. Very different um, uses of you know, COVID in their messaging. So first there's that. Um, I would say, again, as I mentioned in the, the presentation, feel confident and give your consumers some sort of credit that they know that COVID's going on. So you can, you know, drop that um, from a lot of your messaging, um, but it will again be specific to product and surface ser service that you're offering. And if it's kept um, either uh, the re you from fully offering your service or product to consumers that are actively looking for it. That's a great direction and great advice. And I guess it you know comes back to what you were talking about here this afternoon about content versus tone and uh, also that conversation map because how you uh, transition out of that COVID related advertising could be part of your conversation map in terms of you know how that process uh, plays along. So. Again, uh, Rebecca, thank you very much uh, to you and the, uh, the team at SCO Communications for today's excellent presentation. Uh, you can uh, watch it again on our YouTube channel, uh, share it with every, anybody else who you think might benefit from uh, today's information as well. I hope you'll join us uh, tomorrow, May 21st already at uh, 2.30. Our theme is the art of networking with special panels, panel guests, Candace Dennis from Blackbird Radio, Brian Yeomans from the DWBIA and FHC Hotels, Mike Clark from Windsor Essex Children's Aid Society, and representing Parker DKI, Elizabeth Elias Hernandez. We also again have the uh, May 28th webinar with the Windsor Essex uh, County Health Unit coming up, and uh, June 9th with the uh, team from Barter Pay and a new initiative that will be introduced here in Windsor Essex. Lots more business briefs, interactive webinars to come. 
if you haven't signed up for the Chamber's e-news, you should do that. You can, and that can happen on our website. It comes out at least every week, sometimes twice weekly, because there's so much information to share. There's all sorts of details about the Chamber and also uh, information on our webinars uh, there as well. You can find out more information at windsoressexchamber.org. Thank you again to Rebecca Stasco for uh, presenting today. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. We hope to see you again for a future Business Briefs interactive webinar. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Stay safe and stay apart. Take care, everybody.